Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly interview show where top chess players, authors, content creators, and accomplished amateurs discuss their careers and share stories and chess improvement tips. Perpetual Chess is a part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network, and we'd like to give special thanks to our presenting chess education sponsor, Chessable.com. For more information about the show, you can go to PerpetualChessPod.com. But without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We are here for a bonus pod. We are joined by an old friend of the podcast. He is a chessable author of the Trumpovsky Simplified and the Leningrad Dutch and the author of the fantastic book, The Anon Files, one of my favorite chess, especially sort of modern chess history books, but books generally. And I interviewed our guest about that book uh, a couple years back. You guys should go check it out in the archives. And definitely, if you like uh, the the backstory of top level chess, highly recommend the book as well as our prior interview. And our guest uh, lives near um, Vikanzi, the venue, the coastal village where Tata Steele, the much referred to Wimbledon of chess takes place. And he graciously offered to uh, do some bonus pods discussing the tournament, sort of letting us chess fans know what it's like to be there. Um, so I'm super excited to welcome him to the pod and discuss uh, Tata Steel 2023. Welcome to Fide Master Mikhail Ablin. Mike, welcome back. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for the intro. And as always, it's it's a great pleasure to be on your show. I've told you this before, but I'm I'm a huge fan of your work. So it's it's also my pleasure. Thanks. Well, the the admiration is mutual, and it was so kind of you to offer to do this. You know, I live uh, pretty far away here in New Jersey. I really want to get to Tata Steel someday. It's tough when you have kids, but in the meantime, this is the next best thing. Um, and I imagine a lot of listeners might feel that way as well. So, of course, this tournament is ongoing. I suppose we should. So, I'll just quickly mention the standings as we record here again in the top section. They're having a rest day. It, we're recording Wednesday morning, January eighteenth. I don't think we'll spend too much time on what I call the horse race aspect of this tournament because number one, it's early. Number two, I know you all might not listen right when this comes out. So I think we'll we'll discuss uh, what it's like to be there, give some historical context, some games you might want to check out if you haven't already. But I will say, you know, uh, in the um, open section, as we approach round five, Anish Giri and Abdu Satarov are tied for first with three out of four. Uh, surprising, I mean, not sure shocking to see Geary in first uh, after beating Magnus Carlsen yesterday. But obviously, anytime Magnus isn't at the top, it's a mild surprise. Fabiano Caruana and Pragananda are tied for third with two and a half out of four. And then with two out of four, we have Aronian, Irigasi, and Carlsen himself. Um, and on it goes from there. Uh, still early, still lots could change. Um, so, uh, Mike, you, you've been there every day. I should mention you've also been writing columns for The Week in Chess, a fantastic resource for uh, covering chess and downloading games. Shout out to Mark, Mark Crowther. I know you and I are both fans of his work as well, Mikio. But my first question for you about this tournament is, what would someone watching at home who then showed up? And by the way, listeners, there's an open tournament, so you can go and play as well. It's like a chess festival. But what would someone who's going, say, to watch the Elite Chess, what would surprise them from what they watch on their screen to actually being there? So I think um, the, the main thing is that when you enter the tournament hall, it's the, the spirit, the feelings that you get there. You immediately feel that you have arrived at a top tournament where you can also play your own game next to it. And after it, of course, you can uh, watch uh, the top players. But that spirit when you enter the tournament hall is a, is a very special feeling. I, I've played in many tournaments around the world, and I immediately recognize that Tata feeling, and it's only there. It's it's so special. And I think that is, is the first part of today. But then the other part is that as soon as the game, as, as the amateur game uh, games end, what you see is that typically people start analyzing in the bar next to it and in, in one of the many pubs. And next, after that, people go for dinner together. And uh, a lot of people who play the tournament stay in hotels. So they also, after dinner, go to bars and they uh, start playing blitz. And basically, this entire town lives, breathes chess for two and a half weeks. 
and and you feel it when you enter that that very small town. It's it's a beautiful beach town in the summer, very crowded by tourists, but of course in winter completely empty. And then being taken over by chess lovers, chess enthusiasts, and and it's really about that feeling that you will not get online. There, of course, you you get fantastic commentary, uh, you see the exciting games, but being on the ground, it's 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 that atmosphere that makes it so special. Hearing you describe it makes me want to be there even more, Mikeo. Yeah, and uh, our our friends at uh, New in Chess Books have a, a new book just out. You probably you probably can see it there. The uh, called Kings, Queens, and and Rookies: The Tata Steel Chess Tournament, a celebration of eighty five years. So this year is their eighty five year anniversary. Um, and I was reading some of the excerpted materials. I haven't gotten my hands on the book yet, but uh, Erwin Lamy wrote a beautiful intro. And yeah, he de- he describes when you're. When you're driving into the town, you see like banners of uh, chess pieces. And my understanding is it's it's sort of like a beach resort town, but that's only in the summer. And and uh, as as he jokes, uh, no one goes in the summer. So it, I can only imagine that there's just chess players everywhere. Uh, sure, there in no, January. No, no, no one's going there in winter. Is, 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 I, I think. What you right. Mean. Well, no chess players go in the summer and yeah. no, uh, no <laughs> regular civilians go in the winter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. And 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 the weather was just horrible last week before the tournament started. It was stormy and, and windy, and everyone joked, including Anis Giri, "Oh, Vaikanse is ready for the chess players with this weather." <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah, it's an indoor sport, so <laughs> so we might as well uh, might as well have the bad weather. Yeah, sometimes when I'm playing in a chess tournament, if the weather's bad, I'm like, well, yeah, if it was going to be bad, now is. Uh, now is the time. Um, now, something else that Erwin mentions in, in this uh, intro is that, again, there's a hotel where a lot of the players stay. And he says back in the day, even the top players would be congregating at sort of the hotel bar. You could see them doing postmortems late at night. I'm sure there's some legendary stories about some of the uh, the top players who who enjoy the nightlife a bit. Um, but he said that as chess has become more professionalized, you don't see that as much. But I am curious, uh, Mikhail, um, you know, you have, from having written the Anon Files, um, having been in the chess world, being a strong player for so many years, you have personal relationships with some of these players. Um, how much are you seeing of the top players? And then, for example, I know Anon's there helping some of the Indian players. Um, have you ha- had a chance to talk with any of these players? Yeah, I mean, you do see them, actually. So it, I think in the old days, some of the players in the A group were were not in that uh, sports mind that we have nowadays as, as being as fit as possible and, and, and really being prepared for your game. So there are stories of, of, of players in the A group who would get drunk in the bar and, and barely find back their hotel. And I've seen that even as maybe 15, 20 years ago when I was also visiting the tournament. Those days are definitely over. But what you still see is that a lot of these players like to go out for dinner to one of the restaurants. So, and, and like I say, it's a small place. There are maybe 10 restaurants of which there are three or four where typically the top players go. So if you pick one of those three, four, you can run into Magnus Carlsen having dinner there. Or uh, like you said, Fisi Anand uh, is still there. He's flying out uh, tomorrow, I think. Um, and any of the other top players. Uh, occasionally you see them uh, being approached by chess fans for uh, autographs. But uh, most of the time, uh, people leave them alone. They, they respect their, their privacy. It's, it's also their time for a proper dinner. Uh, but of course, it's, it's nice that you sit in the same restaurant as them. And, and that already gives the special feeling again. So in, in, in that sense, you still see uh, the, the top players also uh, at night. But then usually after nine o'clock or so, uh, they disappear. I think on the, on the other hand, uh, there are a lot of seconds in uh, Vaikanse, and I've heard the names, but uh, of most of them. So I know uh, Jan Gustafsson is there. I think he's now working for Anis Giri. Um, uh, Rames is there. Um, uh, Rustam Kazimjanov, he's uh, working for uh, Abdus Satorov. Um, who else? Uh, Srinath Narayan uh, is, is there. Uh, Peter Heine Nielsen. Uh, and, and most of these people you just don't see. They're kind of locked up in their hotel rooms 
working uh, non-stop and and the only other thing they do is yeah they join their player for for dinner but other than that they don't come to the tournament hall at all they they watch from the hotel room or even they take a few hours uh, to nap um so the seconds you don't see so much um fishy uh is is more of a special person he's uh not helping the indian players so much in this tournament he was invited as guest of honor ah okay uh, and uh, in that sense, he's helping the tournament or, uh, com- organizing committee a lot with relationships with sponsors, uh, both local Dutch sponsors, but I also uh, became aware that there are international sponsors or potential sport sponsors who may want to do projects with FIDE who are uh, flying in. And uh, occasionally, uh, Fishy is in the, in the press room, but he's, he's meeting a lot of these people and, and truly trying to help Chess forward in attracting more sponsorship. Um, I was quite lucky that I think it was Sunday when uh, Fishy was in, in the press room and uh, I had a chance to catch up a bit with him and uh, we were analyzing some games. And there was someone standing next to him and it took me almost two hours to recognize because he's been away from professional chess for a long, long time. Uh, but after two hours, I figured out it was Jeroen Piquet. Uh-huh, now, okay. not, not all your listeners may, may know who Jeroen Piquet was, but I think Jeroen uh, made it to at least number 10 in the world rankings, maybe even higher. And then at some point he retired and he became um, the financial advisor of Joop van Oostrom, who we all know as the billionaire who was sponsoring the Monaco Amber uh, tournaments. Right. And, and, and Jeroen moved then to, to Monaco. Unfortunately, van Oostrom passed away a couple of years ago. Jeroen is still not back in chess, but he did move back to, uh, to Amsterdam. Uh, and uh, what I hear uh, from the tournament director, Jeroen van den Berg, is that uh, Piquet usually visits Wijk aan Zee because he, he can, uh, just like myself, not withstand the passion of the town, of, of, of the tournament. So it was really nice to be there with, with Fischi and, and Jeroen Piquet to analyze some of the games while they were going on. Yeah, and how long, um, I mean, I know the trains are amazing there in the Netherlands, but how long a drive is it from uh, Amsterdam to, to Wijk aan Zee? Maybe half an hour, maybe even oh. a little bit less. So it's, it's quite even, cl- even closer than I thought. Yeah, How, what self-respecting chess player in Amsterdam could could yeah. avoid could not stop by? Yeah. Um, well, that's fascinating stuff. I've got lots of follow-up questions based on all that information. But first, I did want to read uh, the aforementioned Viswanathan Anand's tweet um, from five days back, which it shows him with some of the Indian players, and this is what made me think maybe he was. Uh, Um, coaching, but as you say, ambassador, whatever it is, he's happy to be there because he wrote, hanging out with the boys, just revising the emoticon variations because they're sort of uh, making funny faces in the picture. And then he says, happy to be at the 85th edition of Tata Steel Chess. It is our greatest tradition and a January not in Vikanzi is no January at all. So... Yeah, nice warm sentiment there. And of course, you mentioned uh, Jan Gustafsson, uh, Peter Hein Nielsen, um, some of the other seconds. Um, of, so, of course, I'm an um, avid listener of the Chicken Chess Club, and they've been discussing this tournament. And Jan recommended the Italian restaurant. Um, I'm mm-hmm. curious. So you mentioned the restaurants. For any listeners who do make their way uh, there in future years, uh, what is your favorite Vike restaurant, uh, Mikio? It is that Italian restaurant, also because of, of certain memories that um, uh, I've, I've spent there uh, long evenings where basically, um, uh, I think this was 10 years ago when I was also producing reports for the Week in Chess, and some of the rounds would take a lot longer, and we would only uh, get to the restaurant around uh, 10 p.m. And in the Netherlands, that's quite late. Most restaurants would be maybe serving uh, dessert or, or start to close. Uh, but that Italian restaurant um, has a special relationship with uh, the tournament committee and also with tournament director, Jeroen van der Berg. So then w- we could always get a table around that time and, and we would have dinners all the way till 2 or 3 a.m. And, and I have special memories, including some of the chess players who also attended and had to play the next day. So this is what I still call the old life, where right. uh, people were not maybe... Uh, so much uh, looking after the physical fitness as, as they are today. But that Italian restaurant has indeed an, a, a nice atmosphere. I know that uh, Fishy goes there quite quite a lot. I think uh, earlier this week he had uh, dinner there with Pragnanda, 
Um, and it's a favorite restaurant of of many of the of the top players. Yeah, I mean, and to be fair, like I get what you're saying about like people don't want to stay out late anymore. Um, but in my mind, part of it is partially perception as well, because the games start in the late afternoon there, right? Now, now, of course, chess players are notorious for having late sleep schedules, often waking up at 11 a.m. or noon or something like that. But anyway, to me, having a couple drinks wouldn't be a disaster, although certainly you, you don't want to overdo it. And, you know, uh, maybe a doctor, I mean, certainly the, the, the people who study peak performance uh, might beg to differ. I mean, they say that even one drink really affects your sleep schedule. So, um, so, but... Anyway, uh, I do get a bit nostalgic for the for the older days hearing you discuss it. No, and I think the amateurs are still very much treating it the, that way. Yeah, they they see it as their holiday, and they definitely enjoy the nightlife as well. Okay, yeah. And speaking of the amateurs, our next topic is sort of the open tournament and the festivities. But uh, Mike, you know, we do need to take a break and hear from our sponsors. So thanks. This has been amazing already. You're making me wish I was there. But anyway, we'll be back with more in a minute, listeners. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by AimChess.com. AimChess has an algorithm that gathers your games from the major sites like Chess.com and Lee Chess and gives you actionable intel based on the patterns it detects. It can be how you do with certain openings, what aspects of the game you excel at versus need work at. And guess what? AimChess has a new feature that you should check out right now, just in time for the new year. You can check out your year in review for 2022. You just enter your username and it gives you uh, how many hours you spent chess, how many games you played, how you did with various openings. Lots of fun facts uh, that the algorithm is able to gather. So uh, be sure to check out AimChess.com If you decide to try out subscribing, use the code PERPETUAL30 to save 30%. You can also use the link in the show description to try out aimchess.com. And we are back. And as we alluded to, there is a big open tournament. So anyone interested in attending... um, could come in a future year. I should say, by the way, this should be obvious, but I'm not affiliated with Tata Steel as we sit here and do this uh, infomercial for them. Um, ju- just a chess fan, no more, no more, no less. But anyway, this question is from recent Patreon sub Roy Lopes or Lopez. I'm not sure it's spelled L-O-P-E-S. Obviously, very close to a famous chess name. So I'm also not certain, Roy, if that's your real name. I believe he's from Brazil. But anyway, send me some nice messages and thanks for uh, sh- thanks for supporting the pod, Roy. Uh, and he, um, uh, he wrote, uh, how does the average age of the players look this year compared to previous years uh, where you've witnessed it? Um, are the youngsters taking over in the Vike open section as they are in so many other tournaments? Yeah, so I want to split my answer in, in, in both the professional tournament, but also uh, the average age in the amateur tournament. Uh, if, if I look at the professional tournament, it, it's clear, I, I think that trend has been going on for the last 10 years, that top players are getting younger and younger. And I think definitely this year, uh, Wijk has a fantastic uh, field of, of uh, different kind of uh, playing styles, different kind of uh, players in terms of where they are in, in their professional career. And it's, it's a real class, uh, what you see now, uh, with also some of the youngsters uh, moving up in the, in the top of the field after four rounds, which could easily change again at a later stage. But so far, you see that some of the more what I would call arrived players are, are struggling a bit. Uh, and um, that gives, uh, I think, an, another uh, good dimension to the tournament. At least I look forward to all these games and, and see how they fight each other and how they uh, come up with new creative ideas. I especially see that the youngsters um, seem to be um, more creative in in trying to get certain playing positions and then keep on playing. And with some of the arrived players, I see that there's a tendency to to move quicker to equal positions and make a draw. Um, It might also have to do with something that's well known in Weikanze, and that is that it's such a long tournament, 13 rounds, and that uh, typically people do get tired at the end. And basically you can make or break your tournament in, in the final four rounds. So maybe some of these more experienced players know that they can take it a bit easier in, in the early rounds or, or they easy, even shoot, uh, save some energy. 
and uh, they are preparing to score later, where the youngsters maybe still have uh, unlimited levels of energy or or just are not aware of how long the tournament is and, and go for it from, from the start. So we'll see. But uh, I think um, in general, Tata has always done a great job in uh, not just inviting the top players, but um, looking for a field that's, that's, yeah, I would say, uh, always bringing up some new talents and uh, getting more fighting chess. I am a little bit worried if I look at, at the B group, uh, which usually has, I think, one promotion, maybe sometimes two in special circumstances. It's not obvious to me that there's any player at the moment there who would do well in this year's A group, let alone next year. So we'll see. But uh, that that could be... Uh, a very tough uh, tournament for the person who promotes to uh, next year's A group. Yeah, and for for listeners not familiar with how it works, so there's the the top section, which is the one that Magnus is playing in, and obviously rich history with uh, m- many world champions. But in the challenger section, the top finishers then get to play in the masters section every year. So in a sense, to graduate or at least to um to uh, you know, step up their level. I believe Gukesh won the challenger section last time. And yeah, some of the people, there are some young uh, star players in the challenger section. Um, Abi Mishra from the United States, Aline Robers, who had a beautiful win against a uh, uh, friend of the pod, Erwin Lemie. Sorry, Erwin, but I'm sure uh, even though you would prefer to win, at least it was uh, to a top young Dutch player, uh, top uh, woman number one already and 17 years of age. And uh Ramesh Babu Vashali, um, Prague's sister, who, when I interviewed Jakob Agard, he, of course, raved about her talent. And then we have the the KG veteran, uh, uh, Adiban, the beast, um, uh, Jakobar Sindavar, one of the top Uzbek players. So I, I get what you're saying. There's no like... There's no like clear ascendant star in that section, but I'm sure that any of them, I mean, you've got to take the chess player's perspective that, uh, you know, if, if you end up getting beat up by the strongest players, that that's a great rite of passage, you know? Yeah. By the way, it, uh, you mentioned Erwin and Erwin Lamy is, is a good friend of mine. And uh, there's something uh, very special that uh, I saw happening this week. Um all of you may know also when you when you watch some of the live broadcasts that when one of the top players loses a game, they uh, tend to be very pissed off and frustrated. And in the press room, uh, normally you can barely talk to these people. Yeah, they they immediately run out and and they're gone. Uh, Magnus, when he lost yesterday to uh, to uh, Giri, um, was was uh, you could tell from his face that he was very frustrated and disappointed. And um, it's incredible that uh, he composed himself before giving an interview for uh, Norwegian TV, where uh, it looked like he was still uh, reasonably okay with the defeat. But immediately after that, he stormed out and and, and he was gone. Uh, And this is with many of the players who who lose a game. Uh, Even worse, if if you lose two games in a row, then uh, it's, it's a very bad thing. But... Erwin uh, had a, um, a very bad start of the tournament. And, and yesterday he managed to, to win a game, but even there he started out uh, against Misra in a, from a very bad opening position. And at some point Erwin lost his game to uh, Eline Rubers, and Eline played, played fantastically. And of course Erwin uh, was also devastated, frustrated by, uh, with his own play. Um, and he comes into the press room and someone, I'm, I'm sure by, by mistake, asked Erwin, uh, can you do an interview? Now, of course, uh, this is almost an insult when someone has, has lost so horribly. And Erwin, with a big smile, says, well, I think you better ask Elina. And, and <laughs> Good way to handle it, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I, I thought this was such a gentleman, uh, nice way of handling the situation that uh, was really nice. Yeah, and... Uh, and- Listeners, any again, any listeners who have not heard the entire 300 episode 
plus back catalog. Definitely, I recommend my interviews with Erwin Lemie. He's a classy guy. And as someone who's been one of the, the Netherlands' top players for many years, but also been the second of Anish Giri, um, I'm assuming you say Jan is there helping Anish. I'm assuming that's because Erwin, Erwin is in the challengers section. Um, but he has a unique vantage point uh, as both a, a top player and a second. So he's knows, a, you know, well-read and knows a ton about engines and uh, and the list goes on. Um, so let's follow up a little bit more on what it would be like for someone to attend, uh, Mikio, because I have read that it's a, it's a festival. Now, when Sunway Sitges was happening, another top uh, European tournament obviously doesn't have quite the longest, as long a tradition as Vikense, but um, on social media, you see a lot of the events, the, you know, beer making classes or table tennis tournament or whatever it is that they're doing. And obviously it's in uh, South Spain. So uh, weather looks beautiful, et cetera. Now I did read that it's a chess festival there in Vike, but I'm not as familiar with what the events are. Um, could you shed any light on that, Mike? You? Yeah. So and there's not like a single amateur tournament. There are uh, different formats. Uh, there's, there's, it starts with a weekend. Uh, then I think there is a uh, uh, seven-round tournament, and then it ends with uh, a nine-round tournament. And you're only allowed to uh, participate in one of the, the three tournaments because there, there are too many people who want to play, too many registrations. So you need to make a choice. And I forgot to answer uh, earlier the second part when we talked about age span. Oh, what, right. Yeah, but what, what you see is that in the in these amateur events in in the first weekend, because it's a weekend, the average age is is much lower. It's a lot more young people than in uh, the first week, uh, which we're in now. Simply because a lot of the young people have to go back to their studies or to their regular jobs again, uh, so they only play uh, the first weekend the tournament. So if you're looking for a tournament with a lot of young energy, uh, then that's definitely a, a great tournament. And I ran into a lot of people from um, uh, that we know from the chess world who were also participating. So I, I saw the CEO from Chessable. He was, for example... Uh, right, yeah, Geert was playing. Yeah, Geert. He was playing in, in Group 6 or something. Uh, I saw uh, Peter Doches from Chess.com. Uh, he was playing and, and many others. Uh, so, and I would say, I think, in, in terms of rating, uh, people even without rating, people with ratings of 900 or 1,000 uh, play all the way till, till the top level. And in a way, it's also uh, very democratic because every time if you win your group, next year you uh, promote to a higher group. So potentially, if you win 10 times in a row, you're playing against Magnus. Yeah. <laughs> Easy, nothing to it. <laughs> but it, I, I like the principle that it's possible. Right, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, we always want, you know, you always want, um, you always want clear rules. You know, you just want to know what you have to do. Like, it might be impossible, but yeah. but, but at least you know. <laughs> no, and I, um, I think if, if you're traveling, for example, all the way from the U.S. to, to Europe to, to play this tournament, it's, it's a nice story back at home that you're saying, well, I'm going to play this tournament because I want to uh, play against Magnus in the future. <laughs> exactly. And yeah, and, and another thing they mentioned uh, in the Tata Steel excerpt that I read was that there were some years where fundraising was, was more of a challenge than others, but Magnus always accepts his invitation. Um, and it, it's been mentioned on the pod before, but um, the... The prizes for the top section are not off the charts by any means. I think first place might be twenty thousand dollars. I didn't check that, but in any event, um, these these top players they get they get reasonable conditions for coming, um, but they're they're not getting rich from coming to this tournament. Do you, is that fair to say? Absolutely. Yeah. No. Uh, ta the Tata Steel Chess Tournament has never been a very rich tournament. Uh, they always need to control the budget. Uh, I think uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we still had an, an A, a B, and a C group. And in, in, right, in a, I forgot in, about that. Yeah. yeah, in a way that C group ha, ha, is gone now because of budget restrictions. And uh, even for the top players, it, it's well known that um, uh, the appearance fee, which uh, is, is, is a major part of their income, uh, at Tata is, is lower than in, at other tournaments. But uh, 
like you said, it's just kind of the women of chess. And uh, that's why they love the, the playing conditions. That's why uh, they accept their invitations. Uh, but it's definitely not uh, the tournament with the best uh, financial conditions for them. Yeah, um, I, I think players also recognize in 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 uh, especially if 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 you no longer have the ambition to be, become world champion, but you are saying top ten, top twenty of the world. Uh, they they realize that nowadays you can make a lot of money uh, online, Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, chessable courses, etc. And then it's also important that uh, the chess fans keep seeing you playing. And and that's another reason why uh, players also love playing in, in Wijk and Zee. It helps with their exposure. But then I, I noticed something very funny. Is that because uh, the players are so um, aware of their social media image, is that nowadays they do not only prepare for the tournament, but they also prepare uh, five minutes before they give an interview. And, and hmm. that was completely new for me to see. Yeah, I mentioned earlier Magnus, who... Uh, I really was frustrated yesterday, but prepared five minutes before talking to Norwegian TV, where he looks very composed, and mm-hmm. then he's called out again. Uh, but the same is uh, with Anish Giri, for example, who always uh, checks first what, what the engine says uh, or checks with me in terms of uh, what, what were the key points in his game, and he starts thinking about key messages before he actually gives his interview. And uh, it's it's such an important new aspect of being a chess professional, your profile outside, that it makes total sense to me also to prepare for that. That's fascinating. And of course, Geary is amazing at it. I mean, I've mentioned many times, I mean, he's very funny on Twitter, but he's also clearly just like a very savvy guy, you know, so. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, Interesting stuff. Okay, well, Mikey, this has been amazing. I do want to take one more break, and then I do want to talk a bit about the actual chess games in the top section because there have been some beautiful games. I mean, this is audio only, so we're somewhat constrained. But when we get back, we'll point you towards a few games just in case you uh, miss them. Perpetual Chess is proud, as always, to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Chessable, of course, is known for their Move Trainer technology, which utilizes spaced repetition to help you remember tactical patterns and opening sequences. They have a huge library of courses for whatever aspect of your game you want to work on. Some of their new courses include a course on the Tarash defense to D4, which is a good choice if you're looking for a dynamic opening against one D4. It's by Super Grandmaster Jordan Von Forrest. Speaking of Super Grandmaster, Former world champion and legendary trainer Rustam Kazimjanov has a course out on the C3 Sicilian. If you're newer to chess, be sure to check out Friend of the Pod. I am Andres Toth's 1D4 for beginners. And of course, they've got tactics courses too. They have stuff you can check out for free. So if you have not already, make sure you go to chessable.com and keep an eye on their ever-growing supply of quality chess courses. And we are back. And Mikey, you've been writing, as far as I can tell, I, I was playing a tournament this weekend, so uh, I I caught up on the games as best I could, but I haven't been watching the broadcast the way I normally would. Um, but I know that you've been writing recaps kind of focused on the chess for uh, Mark Crowther's The Weekend Chess website. Um, so I'm curious if you have favorite games or overall impressions from the chess games you've seen in the top section, especially. Yeah, I think it's it's been a very fighting chess tournament. Uh, uh, there's a trend that Magnus started 10, 15 years ago, not to do uh, quick draws uh, like we used to know from, uh, say, someone like Anatoly Karpov, who did that a lot. Magnus would uh, play on and on. And I think that's a trend that you see now with all the, the young players. Uh, it feels like they're not nervous at all, no matter who they're playing against, except maybe when they play Magnus. But uh, even yesterday, when you saw a an, an beautiful win by uh, Prakananda against um, Ding Liren, you just see him uh, pressing a very small advantage in an endgame from around move 30. And only around move 60 or 70, uh, it converts into a full point. And I was very impressed by his stamina, by he kept on pushing and, and creating new chances. And uh, maybe it's it's not easy to appreciate such a game if you just play over it. I think you need a, a coach or a trainer to explain it or maybe a nice write-up in, in a chess magazine. But I was very impressed with uh, how he managed to keep on uh, putting the pressure. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's an important skill. I mean, that's Magnus's calling card, of course. So to see uh, one of the young, the young upstarts uh, emulate that and against Ding, against an um, absolute legend, um, I, I have to say it's hard to choose uh, my favorite game that I've seen, but I think it probably is uh, Ding's round one win against Gukesh as Black. Um, did you did you get a chance to check that game out, Mike? You? Yeah, that was in a uh, Queen's Indian. Uh, yeah, uh, where where basically Gukesh gave up his pair of bishops and then applied the wrong concept. Uh, it's 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 funny that. Um, um, I discussed this with Anand, and, and basically I asked him the question: Do you still can you can you see differences in terms of style between the different uh, young players? Because I struggle with that, uh, and the reason I struggle with that is that in in the old days, Tal was known for attack and sacrifices. Uh, you could also tell a player usually by by the openings they they would play. Nowadays, it seems everyone uh, is playing everything. And, yeah. and, and and they can all play positional and they can all play attacking uh, chess. But Anand uh, told me that when you actually work with these players, you do notice that they have preferences in, in the decisions they make and the kind of positions they like and, and they like a little bit less. But you only find that out when, when, you, when you work with them. And uh, Gukesh is then uh, someone who has been raised by a trainer who doesn't like engines. So he's really an outlier in that sense, because as we know, everybody's working with engines nowadays. So from an opening knowledge point of view, he's maybe still a bit behind on some of the others. Uh, on the other hand, he's, he's probably more creative and, and a lot of new ideas. And and that's what you saw in, in this game against Ding Liren, that it, it was, he tried to play uh, very creative, but it backfired a bit and Ding got an, a pair of bishops and uh, managed to open a position with some beautiful moves. I would say uh, moves that uh, we as amateurs uh, would n not easily find. But it, it, once you see them played, you say, ah, now I get yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. This, this is beautiful. And and it's like a piece of, of artwork that's being explained to you. So that's, that's a beautiful game. Uh, there was also a very nice tactical win by Anish Giri. Uh, where he sacrificed uh, a knight and, and then a, a, a rook. Uh, a yeah. in, I think that was round three, if I remember correctly. I, I might be wrong. Maybe you have the data, Ben. Round two, a, uh, a Rogozin. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the, the win of, uh, of Anis yesterday against Magnus was also quite a spectacular game. Yeah, uh, it was. Um, I mean... Anytime Magnus loses in classical chess, it's noteworthy. But yeah, it was a beautiful game. Anyway, go on. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think Anish was a bit uh, bluffing afterwards when he said that he had not looked at this line since 2008-2009. Okay, I wondered <laughs> about that. And, and I was also wondering, I heard some discussion uh, referencing the round two game against Gukesh. Poor Gukesh, by the way. You know, in, in the U.S., in basketball, when you get dunked on, they call it being posterized. I feel like Gukesh kind of got posterized in game one and game two. I mean, really, baptism by fire to uh, have that... Uh, Beautiful game loss against uh, Ding Loren in round one, and then boom, round two. Um, uh, Geary's playing like Morphe, but anyway, in that game where where Geary played like Morphe, um, there was some discussion of how much of it might have been prep. Do you have any uh, either insights or guesses? Um, uh, yeah, no, uh, it, it was. Um, how do you say this? Uh, nearly all prep. Yeah. Uh, the reason that I say that is that. Uh, the position in which Anish sacrificed, he had not seen at home. So Black just made uh, a move, King H8, that um, uh, he had not studied at home. And he was sitting behind the board and he said, okay, I know this position and I know King H8 was maybe not in the first five or first ten moves that the engine mentions. So it must be a bad move. The first move that uh, came to his mind was to sacrifice the knight and then the rook. Why? Because he had seen those sacrifices in other lines that are very similar, but where the king is not on h8, but on g8, but other bad moves. So he was familiar with the sacrifice in, 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 in very similar positions, and he knew that king h8 had to be bad. So that helped tremendously. 
Okay, that's really interesting because that's a very common feeling, even at the amateur level. Um, like, you know a move is wrong, but you don't know why. And that illustrates why grandmasters are always talking about you have to know the ideas of the position because then you sort of have to um, reverse engineer the solution. And obviously with Geary's tactical acumen, he found Rook takes E6 and, uh, you yeah. know, put one in the history books. Yeah, but I, I think Giri and, and some other chess players, Aronian is even better known for this. Sometimes in their in their statements, they bluff a little bit. So uh, yesterday there was this funny uh, event that... Um, Caruana and Rapport wanted to agree a draw in uh, in a position before move 30. Rapport offered to draw. I think it was around move 20. And Caruana thought that this was not allowed according to the tournament regulations. Uh, so normally he would have declined, but he was ready to accept uh, based on the position. And then um, uh, because he was in doubt, he thought, let's ask the arbiter. And and the reason he was in doubt was because Anish had told him uh, early in the tournament that that rule didn't apply, that it was more like a guideline, but not an official rule, and you could ignore it. So Fabi asked the arbiter, and the arbiter says, well, it's better if you play on. So clearly, Anish was bluffing when, when he told uh, Fabi <laughs> earlier. Now, uh, that game continued and Rapport made some uh, big mistakes and basically Fabi felt obliged still to offer the draw uh, before it got even worse because, yeah, in, in a way he accepted the draw or was willing to accept the draw offer earlier. He never really accepted. He asked the arbiter. Uh, so that's why uh, in the final position you see a clear advantage for him uh, and he still offered the draw because uh, that's the gentleman thing to do if you uh, want to accept the draw earlier. But I, I thought the example of, of Anish uh, sometimes uh, bluffing uh, is clear. So he's he's a troll, not just on Twitter, but in real life as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he likes to make fun. Yeah, but that's a classy move by uh, Caruana for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. A, a, admirable. And, and I mean, obviously he does it just because he's, he's a nice guy. But honestly, I feel like it's better, like whatever, even though he's competing for first, he's only half a point back from the lead. But whatever extra value you get from that half point, like the value of being, you know, respected by your peers and your fans and known to be a good sportsman uh, greatly exceeds that that half a point, in, in yeah, my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, the other thing is, of course, uh, you mentioned Gukes, who got hit uh, twice. Uh, what you see at the top level is that uh, confidence, uh, self-confidence plays a big role. Mm -hmm. uh, if you uh, play some good tournaments and things start working out for you, then um, your self-confidence increases and you tend to have more good tournaments. Um, many chess players also in the, in the top 10, top 20 go through phases where they have uh, some tournament victories and high levels of confidence. And then suddenly things don't work anymore and they drop a, a few places. For example, a well-known example is, is, is uh, uh, Maxime fachier lagraf who, who was world number two and now dropped a few places and is then coming back. And you see this with many others. Uh, Fabi has been higher. I think Wesley So has been higher in the past. And uh, with Kukes, it's a bit similar. I think since the summer, he had some uh, results which were a bit disappointing. So he's in this phase where he lacks maybe a bit of self-confidence. And then if, if things start off badly in, 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 in Tata, you become a target. So you can yeah. count on that, that the rest of the tournament will be quite tough for him. Uh, but at least he made two solid draws now. So th th that, that helps a lot. Uh, but confidence definitely plays a role. And, and it can, if you play one good game, it can suddenly be back. And if you play one bad game, it can also be gone. And, and that's what you saw base, basically with Vincent Keimer. He, he lost to Magnus uh, in round two, I think, or round three. And it was a game where um, Keimer really lost from himself. Uh, he, he played below his normal level. There was not an, a clear threat of clear logic he was following. And he was making it way too easy to Magnus. And he was also very disappointed with himself. And for him, it's now also the challenge to turn that around. And and you saw that uh, even yesterday, his opening was was very flat, not in, not inspired. So I think the, the rest day is coming at the right moment. 
And I look forward to, to what Vincent is going to do in the rest of the tournament because just like the others, he, he's a great talent, but he's had now this setback and, and you lose a bit of your self-confidence in such a tough field. Um, and that can be a very dangerous thing. Yeah, it, it is interesting to see these um, these tests that these youngsters have to go through. Um, so, Michael, uh, as we look to wrap up, I'm going to demand that we plug your chessable courses before we go. But um, is there anything else you would say in closing about the tournament? And of course, I would love to do this again um, on, I believe there's there's a few more rest days, but maybe one more rest day as we get to the home stretch, we can cover the tournament a bit more. Um, but anything to add before we plug your chessable courses? Well, what I uh, I love the tournament. It, it's clearly all about the passion for for the game. And in in that sense, I would say if we're gonna do another podcast, people please try to find me on on Twitter and and just ask me the questions. Ask me questions about the games. Ask me uh, things you want to discuss in the, in this podcast. Uh, in, in general, I love the engagement. It's it's the spirit that we have in this tournament that I would like to see more of throughout the year. And and it's the engagement as a chess community where I think we can still work on. And and uh, whether it's chessable or Twitter, I usually try to respond within 24 hours. And uh, I think I look forward to the rest of the tournament. There's, there's a lot of fighting uh, going on. Um, I have very high hopes of Abdu Satarov. Uh, uh, I think Abdu Satarov, so, sorry, mispronunciation. Um, I think he has a fantastic trainer in, in Rustam Kazimjanov. Uh, I, I'm very impressed with the two games he's won. Uh, I think the first one he won in a difficult rook ending where Rapport uh, made a mistake. I mean, Richard Rapport is not a weak player at all. And to outplay him in a, in a, in a rook end game uh, is very impressive. And I think uh, the way he won yesterday again, up to Satorov, uh, again, was very impressive with this maneuvers with queen and rook. So if, if you want to play over another game, that will, that is maybe also a very nice one um, to uh, uh, play out on a, on a board with pieces, set them up at home and, and, and see how he managed to do that. The engine will probably show that there are a couple of moments where Black could still uh, uh, keep the position in balance. But overall, I thought uh, the pressure is still on. And if you try to defend such a position with Black, it's pro- probably hopeless. So uh, very impressive. So I look forward to, to what's going on uh, there. But I think also in the challenges, there's uh, uh, so much going on. Uh, of course, uh, I'm looking forward to Elina Rumus, how she's going to continue to perform. Uh, before we started this, I had a look at her game and, and she's already clearly better against uh, Dutch uh, fellow man, Thomas Beertsen. So let's see how, how she will, but she's clearly a huge talent. Uh, I'm routing for my friend Erwin Lamy that he will somehow try to find his form back and uh, try to start making decent moves. It's a long tournament, so maybe next time we talk, Ben, he's in a, in a much better position. But there's so many storylines in this tournament that I, I really look forward to the rest. Yeah, me, I do as well. And and it's been quite illuminating to to hear your perspective. Uh, you know, obviously, you, you know so much about the chess world and to have you there and to offer to do this is uh, greatly appreciated, Mike. You. So before we let we, we let you go, I already mentioned the Anon Files. If you're into chess history and you haven't read it for some reason, you you must read it. Um, your chessable courses, I have to admit, Mike, you, I'm not a Trump player or a Dutch player. In fact, even though the engine always says my position is good against the Dutch, I never feel like I know what to do, but your courses are very, uh, very well reviewed on Chessable. Um, anything else you would like to, to add about them before we say our goodbyes? No, I mean, in general, the, the courses are made in the same spirit as I, as I write for the Week in Chess, which I, by the way, also do for free. Uh, the courses, everything is going to charity, which is the Max Over Center in Amsterdam. So oh, awesome. Uh, yeah, this is uh, the museum and I'm, I'm a board member, uh, also a non-paid board member and really try to support that. And for that, I use the reviews of my courses. And I, I truly love the engagement with amateurs. I feel that there is a lot of chess material out there. And I've heard this also in, in some of your other interviews, Ben, with, for example, Noel Studer and, and Rames, which, which basically teach us as adult improvers the, the wrong type of things. And I have a passion for being open, being transparent, and really trying to help people. So for example, on Chessable, I think for many people, the, the move trainer is maybe not, not the best thing, but I love the fact that I can keep the courses up to date 
And then on a daily basis, one-to-one, I can give people specific advice on whether a course is, is the right thing for them, whether uh, what to do a certain opening line, etc. And and that that's what I love so much about the chess community. In, in a way, we all love uh, the, the same game. Yeah, and... I, I get what you're saying. What Noel Studer, probably what you're alluding to, certainly what comes to mind for me is it all comes back to this idea of if you memorize a move and you don't understand it, it can be quite problematic. It can actually be counterproductive at times. Now, I don't consider that chessable's fault, but that's something to be cognizant of when you're memorizing. And having just played a tournament this weekend, I had a situation where I was trying a new opening. I played a dynamic line. And as I'm looking at the line over the board before I play it, there's one sort of obvious move that I know isn't the best move, but I don't know why. And I'm sacking a pawn. Um, and that was not a good feeling where, <laughs> where I'm sacking this pawn. And if they play the obvious response, I know it's bad. And I'm, But I'm not honest, Geary. You know, I'm a 2100 player. Yeah. So I've got to figure out what to do. And I ended up not even going into the the variation didn't happen. But it was a reminder that when you do, you've got to, you don't just blindly click through the moves. Make sure it's better to learn fewer moves, but really understand them as opposed to just sort of try to fire hose dump everything into your brain. Well, that and ask the author. Ask me. Yeah. That, that is because I, I recognize this from my own games when I play. You, yeah. have, you have all kinds of questions and doubts that you didn't have when you were studying it. So I always tell people who buy my course, ask the question or, or show your game on your discussion forum. And I'm happy to have a look at it. I, I think the engagement is, is one of the most powerful, but also underestimated attributes of Chessable. Well said. Yeah. And I should say, by the way, the explanation was in the course. I just, I had done the thing where I memorized the move and not the, not the explanation. So um, it was fully on me, but um, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's had that experience. Um, all right. Well, Mike, you'll, I'll link to your, your Twitter bio. Um, yeah. And we'll try to round up some questions and hopefully do this again. But this has been uh, fantastically illuminating and it's always good to, uh, to talk chess with you. Thank you, Ben. Likewise. OK. Enjoy, enjoy the spectacle. Um, <laughs> enjoy the rest of the tournament. Thank you. OK. Take care. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Big shout out to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank the Blue Wire Podcast Network, with whom we are proud to be affiliated. Be sure to follow us on social media, Beneficial1 on Twitter, at Perpetual Chess on Instagram, and or you can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can email me, ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to give major thanks to the Perpetual Chess Patreon and PayPal supporters, those who choose to join that community based on their level of support support can do things like submit questions for guests of the show, have access to live Zoom Q&A lectures with grandmasters who often have appeared on the show, going over chess games, answering questions, stuff like that. And you can even get access to ad-free perpetual chess if that's your preference. So, but most of all, thanks to everyone for listening and we will catch you all on the next episode.